Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the tremendous World Wanderers Podcast. We have an interview for you today. You don't think it's tremendous, Amanda? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what a humble brag. Spectacular. <laughs> what a humble Everyone brag. Everyone loves the World Wonders podcast. People write letters, send emails. I mean, that's a nice segue to throw out a, a thank you to all of our listeners who have written to us um, in all seriousness. It's super cool to hear from you. So if you do have a question, comment, or anything you want to say to us, send us an email at info at theworldwonders.com. So what is happening this week, Amanda? We have Isaac Morehouse here to share with us his stories on traveling with a family. And who is Isaac Morehouse? Isaac Morehouse is the CEO and founder of Praxis, which is the educational program that you're currently a part of. Yeah, and Praxis is a 12-month-long program for entrepreneurial-minded young people who want to learn and improve themselves while working in a really cool role at a really interesting company. So there's all sorts of opportunities. And if you want to find out more, you can go check out discoverpraxis.com. Yeah. And just from my experiences, seeing Ryan go through Praxis, it seems like a really great opportunity to learn lots of neat things and meet lots of cool people, uh, such as Isaac Morehouse. And the reason we wanted to talk to Isaac is he just returned to America from a trip down to Ecuador with his family. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And he... He went down with his wife, Heather, and their three children who are 11, 6, and 4. And this was our first time traveling as a family unit outside of the United States. So it's pretty exciting to have the opportunity to debrief his trip with him and hear, you know, the positives, the negatives, the struggles, the challenges, the things that were amazing, the things that were not amazing, and kind of everything in between. Yeah. And I think we've both talked about while we're traveling when we've met people, we've met people traveling with young kids. I think I remember one experience in Lao where we met a family traveling with a really young kid and thought, oh, yeah, wow, we saw, this is... we saw a three-year-old get on an elephant. Yeah. Which is pretty incredible. <laughs> not by, not by its, uh, itself. Herself. Herself. It was, it was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Just climbed up the leg. Um... <laughs> she was kind of like half monkey. <laughs> um, yeah, but we've both really admired families that have kind of gone out and had adventures with their kids and thought that's such a cool way to show your kids the world and give them a a real like tangible experience and something um, that gives you more perspective than you get, you know, going to school, going to summer camp, that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. It makes me think about the episode we did on the four things you can learn better abroad than you can at home and just thinking about how, you know, that's really applicable to children who are school age as well. And, uh, Isaac and Heather unschool their children. So their, their children are already homeschooled. And so it's really cool opportunity for them to be able to go down to Ecuador for six weeks. The children aren't really thrown out of their daily routine because they already, you know, do all their learning from home and that sort of thing. So even cooler to be able to hear what that was like for the kids and, hear his stories about, you know, how the kids interacted with the people in Ecuador and the climate and the challenges and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So we start the podcast by basically just jumping right into uh, Isaac's story about deciding to go down to Ecuador. Yeah. Enjoy. And so I think a good place to start would be sort of where the idea of going to Ecuador with three children under the age of 11. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my son just turned 11 the last day of our trip. Okay, so traveling with three children under the age of 11, where did that idea come from? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, I mean, it was kind of, it's kind of a long time in coming. So when I was probably between the ages of 12 and 20, and I got married at age 20, well, technically I was two weeks away from being 20, so (laughs) I was 19, but between between the ages of 12 and, and 20, pretty much every summer, I went on a trip and the first one was with my family. It was like a, it was like a, mid- a missions trip with a church group to Mexico and it was with a whole bunch of families. It was like a, a week and a half or something. Um, 
and then after that, I would go by myself. Sometimes I would go with, um, I would go with like different organizations, but I usually never knew anyone ahead of time. And I would, so sometimes we'd go meet in some U S city, like we go to Atlanta for like two days of training. And then we'd spend a month in Peru or, uh, two months in Kenya, um, I've been to Honduras, mostly Mexico several times. And these were more like humanitarian or mission type trips. But, um, I really loved the experience of that travel. And I really especially loved the trips that were like three weeks and longer. Um, cause then it's kind of like, you can't just be excited and entertained the whole time. You kind of have to learn how to do sort of normal daily life in another country, which I really like because you're not sort of distracted. You're, you're kind of like, Oh, okay. Now I'm just sort of doing normal stuff that I would normally do. I have to figure out how to eat lunch every day. I have to figure out groceries. If you're there for less than a, a you know, week and a half, two weeks, you don't have to think about groceries or anything like that. And I kind of like the experience of living a normal day to day life in another place just to see what that's like. And of course being immersed in, in, I love the Spanish language and, and trying to learn that. And I, I hate all forms of <laughs> almost all forms of classroom learning. Um, and so I'd rather just like wing it in a Spanish speaking country for a few weeks and see what I can pick up than like study, study, study. Um, so anyway, I really enjoyed all that experience. And my wife had, um, she hadn't done a lot. She, she, she went to France for like a week, I think when she was a senior in high school. And then right before we got engaged, she spent a month in Australia visiting her sister and she was kind of interested in it as well. She had always come really close to doing things like semester abroad and whatever. And just for whatever reason, hadn't done it, just a little too practical. So we both knew that we wanted to travel internationally, something we have not done since we got married and had kids. We've been married for 12 years and we really haven't done any international travel. She and I have gone to, you know, a few places in the Caribbean for like anniversary getaways and stuff. Um, but we knew we wanted to do that. And the thinking was always when our kids are a little older, when our kids are a little older. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my youngest is is only four. But I thought, you know, I mean, she's old enough. She's four and a half. She's old enough to where once they're potty trained and they don't need to take a nap every day, you have a lot more flexibility. You can travel and do things like that, eat more easily. It's not super easy, but – I was like, let's, let's actually, here's, here's what spurred it. Okay. I've been talking for a long time. For, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge that. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop, but I at least want to acknowledge <laughs> that I have a problem. So like step one is, is there. Um, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the final thing. The, the real, so this was all sort of building. We knew this was generally vaguely something we wanted to do, but we treated it like one of those things you always have, like someday we'll travel. And like, we firmly believe that we would, but it was just sort of we didn't make ourselves treat that desire seriously and actually take any action on it because it's just easier to be like, oh yeah, well one day when it's, when it's affordable, when we have money, when we, when our kids are older, when it's easy, well, it's, it's never easy, right? It's like, oh, we'll have kids when it's convenient. It's never going to be convenient to have kids. Trust me. <laughs> <Good to laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing that really pushed me, I was on the way back from a, from a trip for work and I do a ton of domestic travel just a couple days at a time. Um, and I've gotten kind of tired of that. And I'm on the way back from a trip on an airplane and I was listening to an episode of the Tim Ferriss podcast. And it was one of those episodes where, uh, he didn't have a guest on. It was just like an excerpt from a book to promote like audiobooks.com or something. And it was, and it was an excerpt from the book Vagabonding by Ralph, uh, Rolf Potts. And I just heard that. And I thought now is the time there's never going to be a time that's more convenient. It's always going to be inconvenient. Yep. I'm in the middle of starting and growing a business and it's crazy. Uh, our kids are young and it's crazy. We've got all, you know, it's never not going to be crazy. So I got home from that trip. I ordered the book on Amazon. I gave it to my wife. I said, Hey, I think you should check out this book. I listened to this podcast episode. Listen to the episode. Tell me what you think. She listened to the episode. She read, I don't even think she finished the book. She started it. And she's like, I know what you're going to say. And I'm like, what? She's like, I, I know you're going to say we should do this. And I said, yeah, what do you think? And she's like, it sounds scary, but I think you're right. And I was like, let's do it. It's on. Let's go right now. <laughs> so that was kind of the impetus of uh, doing a trip like this. And That's so, amazing. So what was the kids' reaction to? Um, did you kind of come up and say, "Hey, we're going to Ecuador. Do you guys want to come?" Or, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. So um, it, it was surprisingly like undramatic. We so we we decided we wanted to do this, and we kind of picked a time frame when. Um, the weather is not particularly nice here and things kind of, everyone sort of gets the itch. You're waiting for the nice beach weather and it's, you're, you're a little depressed anyway. 
where I don't have a lot of speaking engagements or other things. So we picked a time frame, which is sort of like um, February, March range. And we started looking at some places and we kind of eliminated some different places based on, okay, well, that's going to be too expensive or, you know, we don't want to take a flight that's longer than like five or six hours with our kids. I just, I don't want, you know, I don't want it to get crazy. Um, so it kind of narrowed it down. I love, like I said, the Spanish language and, and I, I've been to Peru and I loved it. And so we started to look at like central South America. And so we just, we just started looking at Airbnb on houses that sort of met our criteria. It needs to have Wi Fi. It needs to have like three bedrooms. Uh, we wanted to be, uh, on the coast somewhere near, near the beach. Um, and some of the things that we pulled up, just one of the first ones was this, this amazing like Swiss family Robinson themed, bamboo tree house, multi-level tree house type of, I mean, it really isn't in trees, but it's up on stilts in Mompiche, Ecuador. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, this is it. That's it. We're staying here. Both my wife and I grew up watching Swiss family Robinson and like, you know, dreaming about it and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so we kind of looked at some other things and we did a little bit more research than that on Ecuador and, and whatnot found out, Oh, they're on the U S dollar. That's really convenient. Oh, they're in the Eastern time zone. That's convenient. Cause I do a lot of Skype calls and meetings. I was going to still need to be working. So we just looked at some things and thought, okay, it's like a four hour flight from Miami. JetBlue had just opened up a direct route from Fort Lauderdale to Quito. So it was an inexpensive route. You know, we started to, to look at it and we're like, let's let, why not? which has kind of always been a motivating like question for me rather than we got to come up with 10 good reasons to do this. I'm always like, okay, it looks awesome. So to keep me from doing it, you got to come up with 10 good reasons not to, you know, uh, as soon as I saw that house, it was basically like, someone's got to convince me out of this. <laughs> so, so we decided to do it. And so we go to the kids and we're like, Hey kids, um, you know, in, in about six months or whatever, I'm trying to remember when it was, it was maybe August when we planned this, we're going to spend, uh, you know, a couple months or six weeks in, in another country. We're going to go to, to Ecuador and uh, here's a picture of the house we're going to stay in. And the girls were like, that house is so cool. They thought it was great. They're six and four. And they started to, you know, talk about how cool it was that we were going to go to uh, Indigo as my daughter kept calling it. Uh, she, <laughs> she couldn't remember Ecuador. When are we going to go to Indigo? Um, my son was like, um, uh, like, like wasn't angry and upset, which is good. Cause he's, he doesn't like change. And normally I figured he'd shoot it down right away. He was kind of hemming and hawing. He's like, yeah, it looks all right. And he's like, does it have Wi-Fi?" And I said, yeah, according to the owner, the Wi-Fi is faster than ours. He's like, cool. Sounds good. That's so funny. Motivating factor right there for an 11 year old Wi-Fi. Yes. And so then what was the preparation process like? Because obviously, you know, it's not just organizing you and Heather. It's organizing you, Heather, plus three children. Yeah. I mean, really, you know, we had a few, we had a few things that we want that were important to us. One, you know, we're just, we've got three ridiculously expensive kids because all kids are. And, you know, we're not, we're not, we, we don't have like a bunch of money sitting in savings. Like, Oh, let's use our trip money. You know, we don't have trip money. Like I, <laughs> I'm all in building this business and everything. So it needed to be basically, well, this was the goal. We'll get to that later. Maybe <laughs> the goal was that it would be a, a, um, cost neutral experience. So the six weeks were there whatever we would normally spend on six weeks of groceries, we knew we would save some money on things like groceries and normal living expenses because things are cheaper there. Um, so like we save a little money there, but we have to pay for uh, the travel down there and the airfare. So we're going to lose a little money there, but the rent was cheaper than our rent is here. And we rented our house out while we were gone and we're able to come close. Basically what it ended up, the, the initial projection was this whole six month or six week experience was going to cost us the cost of all of our travel down there, which for all of us round trip was like 2,500 bucks or 30, what, something like $3,000 a night, which is no small amount. But, um, you know, it wasn't all that bad considering like we're renting this beach house, we're doing all this other stuff. Or I mean, it was going to come out to a little bit less than that, actually, like $2,000, something like that for a six week experience. And I was still going to be able to work and everything else. So, um, so we kind of did some preparation in terms of like budgeting, planning, what's this really going to cost? What do we need to do? We talked a lot with the Airbnb hostess who um, was from the United States. So it made it really easy. Like, okay, how hard is it to get around down there? How much Spanish do we need to know? How far away from the grocery store are we? You know, what do you do? The water is not drinkable. What do you do there? And she was able to just put us at ease with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. 
things. Oh, well, they deliver water every couple of weeks, all that kind of stuff. And then we looked into things like all these different, you know, diseases and vaccinations, all this stuff. And honestly, every one of them, the more we researched in every case, and, and we're not like, I'm not like anti-medicine or anything. Um, we didn't end up doing any of them. Like I've done the malaria pills before uh, in other countries and I never think it's worth it. It makes you have like nightmares and it's horrible. And if yeah. you get malaria, like it's not even that bad most of the time. <laughs> like, I mean, it can be, I know I don't want to downplay malaria, but <laughs> when you say like the risk of getting it plus the risk of how bad it's going to be compared to the, that, you know, you're going to like take these pills and be screwed up and have like night terrors or whatever. I mean, I've, not everyone does, but even that, so we didn't end up doing anything crazy in terms of the health stuff. We kind of, we kind of, t- we really got educated on it, but we took sort of a calculated, like, look, the risk of these, um, you know, medicines and, and vaccines or whatever, uh, or uh, immunizations being problematic is probably actually higher than the risk of g- contracting some horrible tropical disease if we're just clean and smart. So we did that kind of research. We had to get the kids passports and everything like that. Um, honestly, the hardest thing in the preparation was getting them to uh, stand still for the passport picture. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It kind of makes it seem like preparation went pretty well then, though, if the hardest thing was getting passport photos for children. Well, it did. Um, but we maybe I go back and forth on this. We maybe could have planned better and prepared more to avoid some of the really hard things that we went through on the trip. But when I really think about it, I don't know if we could have, honestly, I don't know if we could have. And if I would have put more pressure on myself to like make sure that the plans are perfect, I think I would have had a lot of stress leading up to it. And I don't even know that I would have been able to, to ultimately change the the outcome of some of the, the harder things that we went through either, but we're, we're not very good planners. We just sort of like, once we decide to go for something, we just sort of do it and we, we get a little bit haphazard. And I'm like, you know, like basically every trip I've ever been on, even if it's a day or two, um, I don't have something that I probably should have had. Like, Oh, I should have had a jacket. It's really cold here. Oh, I should have had an umbrella, but I'm always like, I'd rather improvise than have too much stuff. I hate it. I don't want to spend all sorts of time preparing for everything. I'd rather just like improvise. Yeah, definitely. And so once February rolled around and you guys flew down there and arrived in Quito, what were first impressions like? So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't share because I almost forgot this. Sometime like once the holidays were over, January, February, as it got closer, we left, uh, I think it was February 7th. Every week that got closer, my wife and I both were like getting a little scared and uncomfortable and for no particular reason. I mean, there wasn't anything like rational behind it. It wasn't like we found out new information, but we were just sort of like, what were we doing? We were just all excited about this and it was just kind of a big excitement flurry. But did we really think, do we really, do we even want to leave right now? Do we want, like we're busy or we're not unhappy in our life. We love, what, what are we doing? We're about to go to Ecuador for six weeks. And as we were like seeing friends and they're saying, oh, this is the last time we're going to see you. It started to get kind of like melancholy. And I'm sort like, like, I think both of us were afraid to say it to each other, but we're both like secretly questioning, like, why did we do this? And then, like, it was hard. There was a lot of moments where I was ready to cut bait. And I was, I was actually really glad that we had paid for the house up front and the airline tickets so that we couldn't cut bait without, you know, basically losing that money. And I know it's a sunk cost, but I I was glad that I felt the need to follow through and that I had blogged about it publicly because that made me feel like I had to do it. Cause I think there was, there was moments where we would have just been like, ah, what the heck, let's just stay here. And we can go to like, you know, restaurants that are close by. We never have to speak other languages. It'll be much easier. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What do you think was driving those feelings? (sighs) I think when you have kids, you just become a huge wimp in every way. <laughs> and that's not bad. I mean, there are few things more difficult that I have experienced in life than when one of your kids is ill, for example. Um, even if you know it's just the flu and they just have a fever because it's going to pass in 24 hours. And if it was me and I threw up a few times, I had a fever and I was up at night, I wouldn't be worried or if it was my wife. But when it's your four-year-old, it's like – you just get kind of irrational and you have a really hard time keeping yourself like, well, I want to, well, what if, what if it's something else? What if it's something worse? And it's, it's just really hard to see that and thinking about, okay, we know how to basically keep our kids in a way that keeps us not very stressed. Uh, we could, we're not too worried about their safety in our normal day to day life here. Cause we kind of know how to, how to have things set up. 
And we're not like hovering protective parents super, you know, in, in like a really intense way. Um, we're pretty laid back. But you start thinking about like, we don't know what we're walking into. All we've ever done, you can't even zoom in on the Google um, on the Google satellite photo of Montpiche because it's so small. You can't you can't get like a Google Street View. Like, what is it? What's it going to look like? What's it going? We don't know. We have no idea. What are we doing here? You know. I think it was just that unknown that that used to thrill me when it's just me, but when it's the whole family, and Montpiche is like two hours away from the nearest city and we wouldn't have a car there. We were reliant on other people who barely spoke English to be our drivers. And so you're just like, what are we doing? We're going to be stuck in the middle of nowhere. And I was worried, like, what if the Wi-Fi isn't good and it goes out and I can't get any work done and we're stuck and we have no cell phone signal? And what if we're bored? It's a tiny village. So I think we just started to have all those questions that, that didn't really plague us early on once we decided to do it. But they started to get really strong right before we left. Yeah, it's definitely something I think both of us can relate to, even like obviously we don't have um, kids. But I think before going to Columbia, I think in the days leading up, I was looking online at like <laughs> government reports, which is like the worst thing to do. And yes. they're like talking about taxi kidnappings and like stabbings and rebels. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm going <laughs> to die. Uh, well, it's weird. You never want to look at the CDC or any government sites. But what I did find was every time I started to freak out, it was when it was when I would I would start to get worried because a Montpiche in my imagination would start to worry me out, what like stress me out. But when I would actually go and start Googling Montpiche and read and there's very little, there's not a whole lot of like touristy pictures and whatever, because it's a tiny place, the more I would actually like look at the real thing. And look at pictures people had taken of it and go back and just look at the Airbnb house and look at all the pictures of it and go look at the Google satellite map and look at the highways there and remind myself that once it was like real, every time I kind of engaged with it or even just go to the Wikipedia page for the province of Esmeraldas, then I felt more relaxed and actually started to get excited. But when I let it be this thing in my imagination, it started to worry me. So it was kind of a weird thing. Yeah. Were there is, was there anyone in your life who was kind of like, oh, you're like taking small children to Ecuador? Like that's a questionable parenting move or was it um, really supportive? No, pretty much everybody was like that. <laughs> it was quite, <laughs> like not in a really bad way because my, you know, my in-laws and my, and my parents and my siblings and our close friends, I think they they know us well enough to know that we kind of do some some slightly – crazy things in a lot of people's minds sometimes. And I, I don't think it's anything that crazy, but, mm -hmm. um, so I think they kind of know, like, they're not going to be like, you shouldn't do that. They don't sort of moralize to us, but there's definitely like, why, why are you like, aren't you worried about your kids? Like, I remember my neighbor coming over and was like, so are you guys, are you not going to go now? And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you know, you've heard of the Zika virus. And I'm like, no, I hadn't heard of it because I don't read the news. <laughs> you know, like, I'm hopeless. <laughs> I hate reading the news. It just makes me depressed. She's like, oh, oh. Oh, you're, you're still going to go. Oh, oh, like really judgy, you know? And I'm just like, I'm just like, I, you know, and it just, a lot of people were really questioning. And then of course, once we got there and all of our kids got sick, there was sort of a lot of like implied, see, I told you so, don't you wish you wouldn't have gone? So, you know what I mean? Like nobody said it, but I think a lot of people were like, yeah, yeah, they probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've experienced that just as like, just as us. And we don't have, like Ryan said, we don't have like children who are dependent on us. So that's why I was curious about that. I feel like, you know, anytime you get sick or you get injured or something bad happens, like you get something stolen, it's always like, I told you so you shouldn't have gone. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is what I call, uh, I'm gonna have to come up with a broader name for it, but this is what I call the Steve Jobs fallacy. Um, and I usually run across it with college, you know, cause, cause in my work with Praxis, we have a lot of kids who will do Praxis instead of going to college. Um, and there's this weird thing that happens. If you go to college, no one expects anything of you, right? Like the minute you get accepted to a college, you'll see everybody like, I'm so proud. My son's going to Ohio State. Yay. Good for you. I'm so proud of you. And then they go and then they graduate. I'm so proud you graduated. And then like, I don't know, maybe they're working some crappy job as a loan officer and they're, they hate their life and they're depressed, but their parent is never like, see, I told you so you shouldn't have gone to college. Right. But if you drop out or, or don't go to college period and say, I'm going to do something else instead. It's like, well, if you don't go to college, you better be Steve jobs or else you'll be a loser. Like there's no in between. You're like, well, what if I'm just like a happy, fulfilled person and I'm making 40 K a year, everyone will say, See, I told you so. You should have gone to school. You could have had a better job. So it's this double standard. 
So it's like if kids get sick when we're here at home and our kids, what if they keep getting sick? No one's going to be like, see, I told you, you should have traveled, right? But if you travel and your kids get sick, it's like, like oh, you're horrible. I told you you shouldn't have done that. So there, there's a double standard. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's a good fallacy. I like that. The Steve Jobs fallacy. <laughs> going to have to use that. So and- then once you got down to Ecuador, what did your kids think uh, the first time being outside of the U.S.? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> first, the, our first time outside of the U.S. was really when we spent a day in Miami before we went to, to Ecuador, before we went to Quito. <laughs> we actually, so we actually rented a, a one way car rental from Charleston to Miami. So we drove down there because I couldn't get a very cheap flight on the way there. Um, drove down to Miami, actually drove through the night. So we get to Miami and we have like a day. Um, and our, we have a really early flight and we have a hotel in the airport, which Miami is really nice. There's actually a hotel in the Miami airport. That's, that's pricey, uh, not very pricey, but it's really junky. Um, so we, <laughs> so we're in Miami and like, I haven't eaten or slept like all night I've been driving and I'm kind of like grumpy or whatever. We parked the minivan and we're like, well, let's just check out Miami for half the day before we go check into our hotel. Cause we won't be able to check in anyway. And then our minivan uh, that we'd rented and it had everything in it, including like a thousand dollars cash because we needed cash for, for Ecuador. We come back and our minivan's just gone after like walking around for 30 minutes what? with all of our luggage, our passports, our, yeah. And I just start, I just start freaking out. <laughs> I'm here on the street with all these kids, you know, and, uh, so I start calling numbers and my phone battery is about to die. It's at like 20, it's like a race against time. And I'm calling like the city of Miami. I, mean, I finally figure out there's like a towing company that towed it. I was parked in a spot I wasn't supposed to park in. And I, I like run. It was, it ended up being a mile and a half away. I run to the towing place. And they're like, okay, that'll be like $200 to get your car. Oh, but we only take cash and there's like no ATM anywhere. And my, and my, my ATM card was locked in the van, like inside the towed lot, and I had to go to a different ATM. Anyway, it was crazy. It was totally crazy. So I worked it all out. Um, but that's a that bad a real, start to the trip. That was a real, <laughs> yes, it was. It was a really. It was actually a horrible start. Nobody slept in the hotel in Miami that night. It was all noisy, and it was. So we were not off to a good start. But we flew into Quito, and and then stayed in a hotel in Quito for one night before driving down to to Montpiche. And we got into Quito in the afternoon. And we're all pretty tired and our hotel was like near the central part of the city. And so we just walked down and I'm like, let's, everyone's kind of like cranky, travel tired, like a little nervous. We're in a new country. Nobody knows what to do. Let's just do something that feels kind of familiar. So we, so there's this big mall that's really actually nice, fancy mall in, in, in Quito called Key Centro. And, uh, and it's only a few blocks away. So we walk to the mall and we go and we buy some, some food at, you know, a, a mall, whatever mall food and, uh, and some ice cream and, and kind of everyone's kind of happy and relaxed for the most part. Um, except my wife and I both had like splitting headaches, uh, I think from the altitude in Quito, it's, it's pretty high elevation and it can take a day or two to get used to. Yeah. Um, and we didn't really, we just, for whatever reason, we couldn't sleep that night, but so Quito, it wasn't that, I mean, Quito is a pretty nice city and where we were was pretty nice and everything was fairly well developed. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, this is radically different. The next day was when it got, was when it got real. We had, uh, the guy that was supposed to, to, to pick us up and drive us down to Montpiche and it's like a seven hour drive through the mountains. I mean, you're going, you're not going that many miles as the crow flies, but you're going from 13,000 feet elevation to sea level. Um, across a relatively small country. So it's like windy mountain roads and stuff in this, in this little van, he's going to pick us up. And then he, he texts us and he speaks like a little bit of English and he's like, Hey, I can't make it, but don't worry. My friend is going to come. Nice. Uh, but he doesn't speak any, <laughs> he doesn't speak any English, but he'll be there at nine. And we're like, okay. So we're waiting in the hotel lobby, nine o'clock, nine 30, 10 o'clock. We, we, Text the guy like, Hey, your friends I hear. Oh, really? That's weird. He should be. And we're just like, he's like, Oh, he drove up from Montpiche last night. And we're just like waiting. We're all nervous. It was, so it was like two hours late. He, he shows up. And at this point, cause it was the first day in our trip, my Spanish was terrible. Like by, by about a week in, it was like twice as good. Like it just took me a while to warm up. So we're like in the car. The guy speaks no English. I speak almost no Spanish and nobody else in my family does. And I'm kind of following on my GPS on my phone because even if the cell doesn't work, you can still follow the GPS. And so I'm following and I'm like, I keep being like, I don't think he's taking the right road. Like I'm nervous. I don't know. <laughs> and my wife, my wife feels all sick. She has like a bad headache in the back. My kids are all like groggy and just like laying around and it was all cloudy and gray. 
and we're driving through and the, the further away we got from Quito, the more things just looked like junky and just, you know, like much more poor and whatever. And I think, and there's like, you know, donkeys and people, you know, burning piles of what appear to be garbage. And I think everyone was started, starting to like get worried and we get, we pull into Mompiche and it's, it's gray and drizzly and it had been raining like record rainfall for weeks and everything is muddy and there's like mud and because of all the rain that they can't drain away, there's like garbage flowing from like overflowed streams and stuff. And it's, so it looks like there's like garbage in the streets and it's like gray and depressing. And we pull up and we go into the house and the guy's like, okay, once six o'clock comes, you want to put on a lot of bug spray or get under the bug nets. Uh, there's no hot water on the shower, but you should be okay. Uh, you know, don't flush your toilet paper down the toilet. Here's the garbage, whatever else. And we kind of knew this stuff ahead of time, but kind of like didn't really internalize it. And then he just leaves and he's like, oh, and I won't be able to take you grocery shopping tomorrow. It'll have to be in two days. And there's like nothing but a little, a little like store with some, you know, beer and bread and a few things in, in, uh, Mompiche. And then he leaves and then we're just there. <laughs> and I think, I truly think the way we entered Mompiche set my wife especially up to like decide then and there that Mompiche was a bad idea. I honestly feel if we came on a sunny day and we hadn't had such a hard time traveling, it would have been like totally okay. But there was something about the way that we came that first day that made Montpiche really hard, which is why we eventually ended up leaving there and moving to a different place. But long story, I apologize. I, I told you I was going to ramble. You got to just cut me off. No, that's fine. I think that was a great story. I was like right there with you on the road. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Dodging interesting jokes. because like you always hear things about making good first impressions. And so it's interesting to hear that how like a city or a, a town, I guess, can make such a dramatic first impression on like your opinions of it right off the get go. Oh, I, and I've always felt because I've been to so many cities in the U S for different work travels over the last, you know, five, six years. And the ones that I've returned to every, every city I've realized my first impression is about 60% formed purely by the weather. If it's a sunny day, the first time I go to a city, I'm almost for sure going to think it's a great city. And if it's a cloudy day and it's not usually conscious at the time, I'm going to be like, man, this city is, is overrated. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you have to be there for the sunshine before you make a judgment. Yeah. And to like, if you, depending on where you're staying, like if you stay in kind of like one of the few neighborhoods that isn't that nice, you can come out away feeling like, Oh, that city sucks. I don't know why everyone likes it so much, but, um, you know, happen to stay in like one nice area and you can just make this generalization about the whole city. Oh, and that's one thing, even for Montpiche being so small, every single time without fail that I went outside and just walked around on the streets, I liked it more. It's like the more you kind of like know it and feel comfortable and feel like, oh yeah, oh, there's a fruit stand here. Okay. I know that I can go there. Now I have useful information. I feel more capable to navigate this city. Oh, I kind of understand what the tides are like at high tide. I probably don't want to come here at low tide this. Oh, look at this street. Every time you get to know it and you can't just like look at it on a map or just look at it from the, from the comfort of your, of your house, even though that's really tempting. But every time I got outside and walked on the streets, I liked it more and I felt more comfortable. And it just really reminded me like, I gotta just, this is the whole point of this trip. I want to push myself. I want to, I want to learn to become comfortable if I can. And I'm not going to force it. If I hate something, I hate it, but, um, just kind of engaging it the same way before the trip. Like I told you, I would be more scared of going until I actually started like looking at pictures and reading about it. once you like engage with it, the fear tends to melt away a little bit. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. And it's one of the cool things about traveling. It's like you doing all these kind of normal things, but you're getting out of your comfort zone and you kind of feel like the sense of like, yeah, I'm winning or even something like you go to the fruit stand, you get some fruit and you're like, oh yeah, like that's, that was a big win for me or, um, in Bangkok, for example, we got there and the first time we made it out of the like tourist neighborhood and crossed a big street and like got dinner at like a Thai, like an actual Thai restaurant. <laughs> We're like, yes. It, it, it's amazing. It's amazing how, how that does it. My, my wife and I, even, um, about a year ago, we had a little five day trip to Jamaica and we were in a, in a resort that was like further away. It was like a couple hour bus ride but it's just like a resort. It was just like a little anniversary getaway and we're just relaxing. But one day we're like, let's, let's go see some stuff. We're by this little village. And so we come out of the resort, out of the little, you know, the gates of the resort and, uh, and it starts raining and we're like, screw it. Let's just walk through the rain. And we walk through the rain 
and find this little village and some guy's like, hey, hey, like motioning us to come over. And we go over and he leads us up into his little neighborhood where all these, you know, people are just living their normal everyday lives. It wasn't a resorty place. And we buy a couple like conch shells from him and whatever and nothing major. And then we walk back to the resort and that was it. And we felt like so awesome. Like, okay, I'm so glad we actually like, like conquer Jamaica instead of just staying in the resort, even though it was this tiny experience, something that small just made us feel empowered, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. totally. Small wins. <laughs> Small wins are huge when you're in a foreign country. <laughs> yes, they are. And so what did the kids think of Montpiche? Like you and Heather had pretty like not good first impressions. So what were the kids sort of first impressions? How are they doing at this point? Yeah. So, so Heather's first impression was like, oh my gosh, we're in over our heads. This is way too um, rustic. It's too rough. This is going to be hard. You know, the mosquito nets, the humidity was like a present. My first impression was, oh crap, we're in way over heads because I know Heather is not going to like this. Now I'm not trying to throw her under the bus, but like <laughs> I, I just have a high, she has a higher value for sort of day to day, just conveniences and easy things. And that's not in any way an insult. I don't think that makes her any worse. It doesn't make me better. Nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a, a little bit, a little bit haphazard sometimes, but so I was kind of worried like crap, like it, it was hard. No doubt. I was like, this is a little bit more rustic than we thought it would be and more challenging. And some of the, some of the streets were just a lot junkier. There was trash and things we didn't expect. So I was a little bit, but I, but I kind of liked it too. And I liked it more the more we stayed the kids. It was interesting. My son, um, he seemed okay with it. He was like, okay, I've got Wi-Fi. Uh, he didn't love it, but he was okay with it. My youngest daughter, Again, she thought that the house was really cool because it had like this little rope swing thing in the, in the middle of it with like uh there was like it was almost like a little um like a handlebar on string and it had a, a little uh skateboard underneath it so you could sort of surf back and forth and that nice. alone made her think that this was like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> My middle daughter loved it. She's six and she just like she was like the queen of Mom PJ after like a couple of days. She was just like, go out, walk around. She'd be like, can I go outside? And I'm like, okay, as long as you stay within sight of the house. And then eventually I'd say, okay, as long as you're back in half an hour. And then eventually I was just like, I don't care. She knows this. There's only a couple streets. She had already met some friends, even though she didn't make any attempt to speak Spanish to them. They would just play together. Um so she really liked it and she kind of felt like in command of her environment. She's like, let's go to the, let's go to the grocery store. Let, I, I'll show you where it is. She loves to like learn where things are, learn the routines and schedules and kind of, she's very type A, you know, like be in, be in control, be on top of things. So she really, really enjoyed it. It was really cool to see her, to see her thrive. But all that said, the real thing that made it a challenge and the reason we didn't end up staying there was because uh, it wasn't because of the mosquito nets and the humidity that made my laptop stop working and the <laughs> cold showers and the, and it rain, it just kept raining and raining. All those things were hard, but we would have stayed this, uh, the sickness. So when we came, my youngest daughter had a really bad cough when we, when we left already. And we're like, mm -hmm. okay, it's kind of been getting better. Maybe it'll get better. And then when we're there, my son gets it like horrible cough, um, and kind of like upper respiratory thing. And then he starts getting a fever and then he gets a little diarrhea. Didn't, it wasn't horrible, but he kind of had to just lay around for a couple of days. So one of us kind of had to be in the house most of the time. And then my youngest daughter, um, she got sick, like really sick, started throwing up for like three days, like oh, wow. fever throwing up and we got so one night it was like three in the morning she was up and she was she was like delirious she was saying like that she was she was scared because she saw something in her room and just acting weird and like you know and we're just i'm like looking up you know typhoid yellow fever dengue fever like zika virus malaria trying to look for all the symptoms and of course she had like one symptom from everything you know and i'm mm. just like I don't know if it's anything serious. I don't think it is with my rational mind. If we were home, I probably wouldn't be worried. But because we're in Ecuador, I'm like, who knows what it could be? And my wife is just like up with her at night and she won't sleep. And she's like in I mean, three in the morning one night. She's like, we, we've got to we've got to just take her in to see somebody. And Esmeraldas is two hours away. So I go out into the streets of Montpiche at three in the morning. I barely speak any Spanish and I know two people where they live. So I'm going to their houses and I'm yelling and, the, and it's high tide and the waves are so loud crashing against the breakers because the city's right right there on the coast or the village that you can barely hear me. And I'm like yelling in my horrible broken Spanish, like, <laughs> like, necesito ayuda para mi hija. You know what I'm like? I'm like, it's emergencia. <laughs> and, uh, and nobody's getting up. I'm out there for like an hour. Um, the only people I saw were two Canadians who were super high and they were having like a fight with each other and they didn't notice me at all. <laughs> 
everyone else ever – sorry, it's no offense to Canadians. They're, they're, it was actually quite funny in retrospect, but at the time I was all stressed. So I come back to the house. I'm like, Heather, I can't find anybody who can drive us to Esmeraldas in the middle of the night. And she's like, you've got to go look again. Like, ah, she's all freaking out. So I try again. Nothing happens. I come back. My daughter threw up one more time and then fell asleep. And we're like, okay, we can wait till the morning. So in the morning, we took her into Esmeraldas and uh, go to this clinic. And, you know, the doctor's like, oh, I think it's a foodborne thing. It'll be gone in another three days. I don't think it's anything serious. Here's, a, here's an antibiotic and here's some, you know, some, some other stuff for her. Uh, the medical care down there, by the way, is super, super cheap. Um, and it was actually good, good quality. Um, and we drive back from Esmeraldas and the next day, uh, she was okay. But there was like three days where it was – and that was in the middle of that night. And these dogs kept barking all night and my wife is kind of a light sleeper. And it was in the middle of that night where my wife's like, we can't stay here. We'd been there for about a week. She's like, we have to leave. Let's get out of here. Book us a flight. So, so this is, this is where it gets, uh, this, this is where we made our mistakes. So I'm like, screw it. We're out of here. I book us a flight back to Florida. And I'm like, we had rented our house out. We knew we wanted to finish the rest of the six weeks and we're only like a week and a half in. We'll just we'll just find a, a house in Florida and Airbnb and stay there for the rest of the time. It felt like kind of a defeat, but it was like, who knows what's happening? We're facing all this illness. Everything my computer's not working, and I have all this work to do. I'm getting way behind. Everything's crazy. Mm-hmm. We just can't do it. You know, we're just wimps, I guess. So so I booked this flight to Florida, and then I'm like, okay, you find us an Airbnb in Florida. And so for the next two days, my wife is looking, and there's like nothing. It's like some crappy ranch house an hour from the beach in some random suburb for like a ridiculous amount of money. And we just start looking, we're like, this is, this is just dumb. Why would we do this? And so then I'm like, let me just look in other places in Ecuador. Cause this one guy had told us that once you go a couple hours South, it doesn't rain all the time. It's not humid. It's very arid. It's like, it's like Northern Peru. It's very dry on the coast, uh, Southern coast. And it's, it's beautiful and blah, blah, blah. So I start looking and I find an amazing place just South of Manta that's really, really affordable. It's right on the beach. It has a pool. It has air conditioning. It has hot water. And we were just like, oh my gosh, this is like luxury. And so we ended up booking that, but our flight was non-refundable. So, uh, so now, yeah. so now you've added, you know, to our wonderful trip, which was going to break even non-refundable flight back to the States and gone. And then we had to book a separate place and we couldn't get, you know, refund for the, for the extra four weeks in Montpiche that we didn't end up staying. So we're paying for a second place. Well, needless to say, our budget got a little bit, a little bit <laughs> blown. But the second half, the second month, we were in Monta, south of Monta, in a gorgeous house right on the Pacific coast with a bunch of French Canadian expats in this neighborhood that was mostly uh, developed by French Canadians who, who moved down there. Um, it was amazing. I got tons of work done. It was a great time. The kids loved it. We did have a little bit of lingering sickness, but it wasn't any big deal. It was it was really a great time. Um, almost almost too easy. I almost felt like we let ourselves off the hook uh, on the <laughs> second part of the trip, but um, the first part was just a little too hard. I think under different circumstances, Montpiche could have worked, and Montpiche would be a great place to go for a week or two with a couple buddies and go surfing with kids for six weeks. It is a little bit rough, uh, and I don't know that I would I would do that. Monta, totally doable, um, really really cool. And um, when the kids were going through sickness, were they did they want to go home, or what, what was going on in their heads? Yeah, they didn't they didn't really say anything about wanting to go home. What's weird? This entire six weeks, none of my kids said anything about wanting to go home or being homesick, which I was really surprised because they have friends and, and, you know, routines and things back home. And when we got home, especially my son, he was like, wow, it's really great to be home. I'm, I'm glad to be home. This is nice. And my daughters as well, but none of them were like, I want to go home. Uh, they were just acting like kids act when they're sick. You know, I think it was more us like experiencing sickness when you're in a location that's so remote and you don't know the language, I mean, even when I was at that doctor's office, the doctor was great, but he spoke no English. And so my very little Spanish, like it was hard. I had to have him repeat things over and over and like make sure I understood what he was saying about the prescriptions. Like it's just hard work. Like you're not, you're in work mode. Like your brain has to be so engaged all the time. You know, people say, oh, oh, places like this where it's, it's, you know, more, uh, it's poor, it's less developed. It's the simple life. A couple of people said that like, oh, Mom Piche looks great. It's, it's like the simple life. And I'm like, nothing could be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's the opposite of the simple life. The less, the less developed a place is, 
the more complex it is. The less complex the social and economic institutions around you, the more complex daily life is because things like making sure you have food and shelter and medical care become incredibly co- – oh, I just need clean water and the sewage not to back up. Those become incredibly complex problems because you have such a simple substrate, whereas if you have a really complex system, you know those things become simple. So um, anyway, it was – it was interesting. The kids were, were, they were like sick kids. They wanted to be done being sick, but they weren't like, let's leave this place. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's probably the interesting thing about, um, the age that the children are at. I, like I got really sick when I was in Ecuador and I, that's probably one of the only times that I've ever wanted to go home on a trip because we were in a terrible hostel. I was so ill. I'd sprained an ankle in Colombia and I was like, why is this happening? Like, I just want to be in a clean bathroom where I can lie on the floor and be yeah. ill. <laughs> it, it's funny, even in, so even in Monta, even though like things got so much better and much easier, um, we, so we get there and my daughter had just started to get better and then my son gets sick again and he, and he didn't throw up or anything, but he had a fever for just like five days. It just didn't make any sense. He didn't seem that sick. He just kind of had to lay around. Um, and so we're like, oh, okay. And then I sprained my ankle, just like not doing anything cool, not like mountain climbing, like stepping outside the screen door. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in flip-flops, right? And uh, I wasn't doing anything so, cool when I sprained mine either, by the way. <laughs> no, because I was like, this is great. I can take a run on the beach every day and get all this exercise. I couldn't run. I could barely, I was like hobbling around. And so it's like, okay, a little bit inconvenient. And then, and then my daughter, my youngest daughter, who had been through all this sickness, uh, and by the way, three days after we got home, just yesterday, she got, she got sick again. She seems, <laughs> she seems okay now, but oh, no. that kind of, that kind of reinforced that it's, yeah, it's not all Ecuador. But then she, she broke her nose while we're like, literally, she, ju- she's just playing around being a kid, jumped off of a chair. This is while we're in Manta with like two weeks left to go. Everyone just started to get healthy. We're starting to relax and be like, this is, this is really what we intended the whole time. Yeah. And she just jumps and smashes her face and then her nose like swells up like a balloon. It turns all purple, you know, and I'm like oh. looking everything up to make sure we don't need any medical care. And, um, it, it all healed fine and she wasn't crooked or anything, but her nose was like black and blue and like bleeding and all this stuff. I mean, it's just, we just felt like, why can't we catch a break? You know, it yeah. was, it was, it was pretty crazy at times. Were you guys sick at all or was it mostly just the kids? Um, yeah, both my wife and I had like a couple days where we pretty much had to just be in bed all day and like a little bit of diarrhea. And we all got this cough, this sort of nasty cough. Um, and again, that might've been the one that my youngest daughter brought down with her. I also had a couple of co- colleagues come down and visit us in Monta for five days and do some work with me. And one of them brought a horrible cold with him. And when he left, we all got his cold, like the last week we were there. So it's like this weird combination <laughs> So like somebody was sick at all times, not brutally sick, but just like not 100%. Yeah, that's too bad. It seems like it happens on vacations like way more than it should. I don't really know what the reason for that is, but I guess being in Ecuador. Yeah, I mean, you know, travel takes it out of you too. I think just being in like cramped airplanes and airports for, you know, with all these connections and stuff over a 12 hour period, you're just exposed to all these germs, your immune system's down. It's it's pretty normal, but it, this took it to a level that we hadn't experienced in the past. And at the start, you kind of said, if we had planned better, maybe we could have avoided some of this stuff that happened. Um, what do you think that, like, what might have you planned differently if you could go back in time and do it again? Yeah. So, so first I was like, man, I'm kicking myself about, you know, if we would have just booked the place like in Monta from the start. And then we wouldn't have had to, to, you know, dump money on a plane ticket we didn't end up using because we didn't end up flying back to Florida early. So that was just a lost cause. So we just kept our original flight. If we didn't end up having to pay for, you know, different places, blah, 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 it would have saved us some money and it would have saved us the heartache of, or, you know, just the difficulties in Montpiche, et cetera. But when I really am honest and think about it, like from what I could tell from where I was sitting and just the level of, of research I'm willing to put in to, to get to the, the ability to discover that information that like, Oh, Montpiche. Yeah. I knew it was the rainy season, but normally it just rains once a day really hard. And then it's sunny the rest of the time, but this is like El Nino and literally they have a record rainfall more than they've ever had in 20 years. So like I couldn't know that. 
the level of research it would have taken to know that would have been a level of research so high that that I would have never picked any location because I kept I would have kept any okay like well this one could be a little better than this one maybe we should go to Panama maybe we should so I just know like what it would have taken to know what we ended up discovering probably realistically couldn't have been known at least not uh, and if it could have I would have had information overload and I wouldn't have been able to make a decision so part of me is like oh I should have planned better but part of me is like. The only way to plan better is by learning what I learned by doing it. And now I know if we want to go back to Ecuador for a month, for two months, for two weeks, take other families with us, whatever, at any time, I know exactly how to do that in a snap. And it'd be easy. It'd be enjoyable. I know every single thing. I know which restaurants and grocery stores to go to. I know which neighborhoods, which cities. And, and now I know, but I don't think I could have figured that out without trying it. I really don't. Uh, maybe I could have, but... I, I think that's maybe a little unrealistic. So um, theoretically, we could have planned better, but I, I don't think I don't really know that we could have. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And based on the things that you learned that you could apply to a trip back to Ecuador, do you think that there's things that you could apply to going to a different country that you guys took away? Yeah, I think so. Um, a couple things are to to know which of the small things really matter or, or maybe, um, okay, you can handle any one of a bunch of small deprivations, right? Like it's not convenient to not be able to brush your teeth with tap water, but that's not a big deal. You can adjust to that. It's not convenient to not have hot water in the shower, but that's not a big deal. You can adjust to that. It's not convenient to not have a place to do laundry or to rely on someone to drive you, but any one of those individually you can adjust to, but I think you have to know your tolerance level for the sum total, because those small things are what get you. They're what add up. I mean, as much as the sickness and things like that were like really hard, I think it was the fact that we were experiencing sickness while we were in a place where like it's really hard to go to the store and get some chicken broth or whatever. Like all these things add up and everybody who's trying to tend for the person who's sick is all sweaty and hot because it's like 100% humidity and 90 degrees. So I think knowing like, okay, I can handle any one of these 10 things, but I can only handle five of them total. So I need to know, I need to pick a place that has certain things. Okay. If it's, if it doesn't have AC, it needs to at least have, you know, um, a certain climate that is tolerable. If it, if it's two hours away from a grocery store, it needs to at least have, uh, you know, uh, other comforts that I know are going to be valuable to me, or I need to be able to get a rental car. So I think there's some sort of there's some sort of total quantity of small inconveniences that you have to kind of know for yourself that you can tolerate. And it might be different for, you know, like me than Heather, but we need to know between us what we can and with the kids. So um, that's one thing I think you could apply. I think the climate um, and the amount of sunshine is more of a big deal than I expected because it just, if any, things are going to go wrong on a trip, they're going to go wrong. If they go wrong and you're in a place where the weather's beautiful most of the time, it's really a lot easier to deal with. If they go wrong in a place where like it's probably going to rain and pour and be cloudy a lot of the time, I feel like it make it just like compounds it and makes it really really hard. So, if you're going to be in a place with bad weather, maybe be in a place that is a little bit more luxurious. Uh, and if you're going <laughs> to rough it, be in a place where roughing it uh you got at least you have sunshine and perfect weather. Yeah, that's definitely fair. That's good advice. I feel like it's because everyone's like needs are different. So I feel like making a list of the things that you kind of need and then going from there and kind of figuring out, you know, okay, we'll have these ones in this place, but not these ones in this place. And then picking a place based off that stuff is definitely good advice. Yeah, And it makes me think about one of the nice things about kind of being on a a, a backpacking trip where you're going from maybe new place to new place, like every, every week or, um, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer is that you get to kind of feel it out and say, like, we're roughing it out and staying in kind of like a hut that has no AC. And you're like, okay, that was fun for like a week. And now next time we're going to next place, we're going to go stay and has AC and has some of those luxuries. So you can kind of like build yourself back up a bit and then go back into that other thing. Yeah, I absolutely think that, the way that it ended up working out for us, I actually kind of appreciate some of the things about Mompiche more after we went to Monta because Monta was so beautiful and idyllic and, and peaceful and 
luxurious in many ways. We're just right on the Pacific Ocean with like a pool that overlooks the – I mean just just absolutely awesome. Um, but it was also further away from any town and kind of isolated. And so you didn't have like Montpiche. There were just like surfers and people from all over the world hanging out at these little, you know, little bars and, and um, restaurants every evening. And you're kind of like right in the middle of this little village and things are kind of happening. And I kind of started to appreciate that element more once we were away and vice versa. Like, I mean, we truly felt like kings and queens of the universe stepping into that house in Monta because it had air conditioning and yeah. it had screen and it had windows that closed. Like the bamboo <laughs> hut was all open. You know, everything was just wide open. It's like we didn't need mosquito nets and that made us feel like gods, you know? Yeah. Do you think that in the future, would you book like one place the entire time for your trip or would you try to be a bit more flexible? Yeah. So, you know, my, my, I think it was like as an individual, I love the idea of just being flexible, but I thought, you know, that could be too hard with kids. It's, it's, you know, it's much harder to find a place that has, you know, a couple bedrooms and stuff like that. So we should probably just book something ahead of time. I, I would probably still be comfortable going in with one place that I said, okay, this is the default. We're going to plan to stay here the whole time, but we're going to try to book it in such a way where maybe we can, you know, we can book it for a few weeks, but we can see if we can only pay for part of it ahead of time or, or whatever. But even if we have it, but I think one thing I would do is I would buy one way tickets and cause we planned six weeks, but we'd never done this before. So we had tickets there and tickets back six weeks later. Um, and I think it would have been maybe better to just say, let's go and let's plan on being there for six weeks, but maybe after a week there, we'll decide we'd rather be in Peru or we'd rather be in a different city in Ecuador. And now we have a little flexibility where we don't, we're not, um, anchored to getting back to Quito in six weeks because, you know, we have this return flight out of Quito. So wherever we are, we have to be able to somehow get back to Quito, uh, by the time we're going to go home to catch that return flight. And if we'd had a little more flexibility, you know, my friend was like, oh, here's this awesome place in the mountains of Colombia. Like maybe we would have gone there and then just booked a return flight home from Colombia. So I think I would book a one way flight, even for the whole family and, yeah. and plan on staying for a certain amount of time, but have enough flexibility that in case, you know, like we didn't, we didn't know that you could fly out of Monta for so cheap. So we ended up booking additional flights, you know, from Monta to Quito on the way back. But, but figuring out like, oh, maybe Guayaquil is actually a better airport to fly back from and we're closer to it now. If we would have just booked one way, we might have done that on the way home. So I think one way tickets for sure. Uh, a house um, can go either way. With kids, it's a little dicey if you don't have some place booked after your first two weeks. Um, I wouldn't want to be in a position where we're like forced to stay in a one bedroom hut with all the kids or something. But um, but I'd be open to it. I think. Yeah, or having that situation where like there really isn't anything available, and you end up paying like way more money for a hotel room that you never would have stayed in if you had somewhere else type thing. Yes, exactly. Oh, and one quick thing that might be a very practical tip for, for your listeners and, and may, many people might already know this, but so when we're, when we're, when we realized Florida was going to be just a stupid option and we're like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's look at other places in Ecuador. And I was, and I was looking at other places too, like, okay, well, our tickets are already a sunk cost. So let's just look at where, where else we could be. I look on Airbnb for places that met our criteria, you know, we want to have Wi-Fi, we want to whatever. And there just wasn't hardly anything, especially on such short notice. And I was like, well, I guess there isn't anything. And then I thought, you know what? It's been a long time since I've, since Airbnb is so popular and it's sort of taken over in my mind, I sort of forgot about homeaway.com. So I go to homeaway.com and I found like five things that were exactly what I wanted. Um, and that was really, really helpful just to not forget, like even though Airbnb is sort of dominating there are other things and not everything is listed on Airbnb and especially home away. If you have a whole family, they specialize specifically in an entire home for a family for vacations where Airbnb is a lot more like one bedroom apartments and a whole mix of things. So that was just a really like, if I hadn't thought of that at the last minute, we would have come home early and never gotten to experience that last month, which was just absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's awesome advice. I know like booking hostels, I almost always use hostel worlds and there's the occasional time where I've gone on hostel bookers and they've had, you know, a room or space in a hostel that we really wanted to stay in that was sold out on hostel world. And it's important to remember that there's other services too outside of the, the one big one that sort yeah. of dominates. 
Yeah, and I, and I almost feel like when you're searching initially, if you haven't decided on a location, it's overwhelming to know that you could check five different websites to look at houses in any country in the world. So, so when I'm searching for an initial location, I actually like to be like, look, I'm going to go with the industry standard. Airbnb will tell me where I want to go. Yeah. But then once, but if it's the other way around, if you already know everything except the house you're going to stay in, that's when you want to go look at five different places for the house. Cause, cause your, your, your information is so much tighter. You don't get overwhelmed. At least that's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely agree with that. What were some of the highlights of the trip? I know we've talked a lot about kind of the things that didn't go, <laughs> go great, but what were some of the things you guys really enjoyed about being in Ecuador? Yeah. And I, and I want to make clear that like, I always want to talk about like the reality. Like, look, this was really hard. It was harder than we thought it was. There were a lot of times where we were like, oh my gosh, why can't we catch a break? We had sickness, whatever else. I, I want to be real about that. I don't want to just be like, oh, look at these beautiful Instagram photos. Isn't my family adventurous? You know, <laughs> um, like it was, it, it was very hard. I want to be real about that. But yeah, no, we appreciate that for sure. I, we're, we're about being real with stuff with travel. Yeah. But my, my fear is that I, I think I sometimes make it sound like it was like all bad or too bad. Cause I, cause I sort of like, to me, I'm a, I'm a natural optimist. To me, it's like a given that this was awesome. So yeah. I want to sort of like, of course this was awesome, but let me tell you all the reasons it was hard. So I want to make sure people know like this absolutely was amazing. And I, and I would say, yes, I would do it again. Yes. I'm 100% glad we did it. I wouldn't trade it even considering all the stuff we went through. Um, you know, I, I think, I think one of the key things that is important is to understand that you're not going to be able to have your trip be all of the things that it could be. So, so I didn't, I didn't realize this until we went there because Manta fulfilled about half of the things that I wanted to happen at this trip. I wanted a place where like, it's gorgeous and beautiful for a really low cost. And I get to get a lot of work done and a lot of writing. And I got the ocean out there and my kids can, can go swim at the beach. And it's, you're kind of having that like beach luxury and, and I get work done because it's got great Wi-Fi and whatever. But I also wanted a really challenging culture experience where you kind of have to fight to survive and learn a new country and whatever else. And I think, I think those are two different trips. Mm -hmm. And I think I wanted both of those. And we ended up getting them both in two basically different trips in one. We had Montpiche, which was like a fight to survive. And, uh, we, in a good way though, too. I mean, Montpiche is really cool. And Manta, which was like, wow, this almost feels too easy, but it's really awesome. It's beautiful. You know, like if I just said, Hey, if you have a job where you can work from anywhere, you should just like spend a couple months working out of a beautiful house on the coast in Ecuador in Southern Ecuador. Cause it's just like super awesome. And it's beautiful. And why do that instead of working in you know a house in the suburbs or whatever. Um, but I, but I think trying to ask of your trip to be multiple things at once, do you want this to be like a challenging cultural experience or do you want this to be like, Hey, let's find a luxurious, awesome beach place for way cheaper than we could in the States. Those are two very different trips, I think in, in some ways. Um, so we kind of got a bit, a bit of both of them. So the, the highlights to me were, um, I mean, one huge one was just being in both places right on the coast. Now I live in Charleston. I'm 15 minutes from the beach, but being right on the beach and the, the, the sound of the waves and the Pacific ocean is just so much more like powerful than the Atlantic, at least where I am. Like just the waves, they, and the first few nights were like, is it, is it a thunderstorm? Cause it's just this crashing, like deep rumbling. And it's just, it like puts you to sleep. My wife always needs like a fan on or some white noise. When we were there, she didn't. Cause we had this beautiful surf. You wake up to it, you go to sleep to it. You just kind of like wake up and go to sleep with, you know, with the sunrise and just it, it being in a place, again, you couldn't afford that in the States unless you were really, really wealthy, where you're on this gorgeous coastline. That was amazing every single day. Every single day I looked out the window, I watched the sunset over the, the Pacific. I, I walk along the beach. You know, you go right when it starts to get dusk and, and you, you walk out and the air just smells beautiful. And it's, I mean, that, that's just amazing. That's truly amazing. Um, another highlight was just being immersed in a place where I had to be forced to try to learn the language better. And like, I took so much pride in how much I improved over the time we were there. Um, and it just really, it was exciting. And, and I think it was cool, even though my kids, like I, we didn't force them to do anything. I thought they would try to speak the language more than they did, mm -hmm. even though they didn't. It's interesting because they actually picked up a lot more than they let on. Cause they would sort of watch me or be like, dad, come tell this person. Or they would, 
And then every once in a while, they would just say something here and there. And like watching them treat this whole experience that was very exotic to my wife and I, they kind of didn't see it as all that exotic. They just thought it was like kind of a cool, fun time. Like they kind of came back and bragged to their friends about different things that they have in Ecuador that they don't have here, like exotic fruits or whatever, but only a little bit. They were just kind of like, yeah, you know, we do stuff here and we check it out and do stuff and we did stuff there. Maybe we'll go somewhere else and see them like normalize it. Sorry to interrupt, but why do you think they're just a bit more like nonchalant about it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, part of it is, part of it is I think my wife and I tried to not play it up into a big thing the way that like, if we're doing like a family vacation to Disney, oh God, I don't want to go to Disney World, but whatever. Like as, as an example, it'd be like, aren't we all excited? Isn't this great? This is vacation. Like you, you know, you, you better get excited and like it because this is our one vacation week. Um, and we've tried not to have that mentality. I mean, we unschool our kids. So they kind of like are really free to do what they want all the time anyway. And so to them, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, we get the ability to do whatever we want or, you know, do something crazy. Like we kind of try to make that. I I take them with me on work trips every once in a while. I kind of want them to see it as not that big of a deal. And like being in another country, traveling the world, you know, oh, you want to spend some time in a beach house? Like you don't, you're not limited to looking at, you know, Myrtle Beach or something like that. (laughs) There's all kinds of places all over the world. So I think we've kind of tried to not make a big deal of it. That might be part of it. But part of it too, I think when kids are young, you know, I didn't do any international travel until I was 12 and that's sort of young, but it was like, whoa, I'm crossing the border into Mexico, you know? I mean, yeah. okay, that's, I did go to Canada, but that's not international. I grew up in Michigan, so it's almost <laughs> the same. Um, you know, and I think when, when you're four, like, or six or 10, you know, to them, my kids, like they moved from Michigan to Virginia and then to South Carolina. There's nothing in their mind. Like they don't, they don't know that it's like, oh, it's a lot, you know, it's greater mile. It's so many more miles away. Wow. This is a bigger deal. Like to them, it's just going to a new city. You know, like Miami was no less exotic to them than Quito. Truly. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. my wife and I are inculcated with these artificial borders on a map. So we like think that it's a bigger deal, but to them, it's like Miami was a weird place. There's a lot of people that are like speaking different languages. People wear really weird fashions and like everybody wears sunglasses. They kept commenting on like how, how weird and cool Miami was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and to them, it was just all, this, it's just a different place, you know? Yeah. That's really interesting to think about just like through a child's eyes when they don't have this sort of understanding that adults have as to the way society is, I guess, and the way it's like, you know, we have these like preconceived notions as to, you know, what South America is like, or is going to be like, or, you know, from the news or media and that sort of thing. And children don't have that. It's just like, oh, this is a cool place. My family's here. We get to like play and have fun. It's funny. You can see almost developing in front of your eyes, the reasons why they will why we became the way we are, why we all think it's such a big exotic deal and why they might eventually come that way. You can almost see part of it forming in the way that our, our governments and bureaucracies sort of, you know, treat it as this big difference. Like, Oh, going from Michigan to Indiana is nothing. Oh, but going from Michigan to Canada, there's a bunch of people with guns in suits who have to like, look at your passport and interview you. And so they enforce this idea that, Oh my gosh, what I'm doing now is a really big deal going driving you know down from Charleston to Miami there was never anybody with a suit that said like show me your papers you know mm-hmm. uh, but that did happen and so it starts to enforce in their minds i remember my my son was or i think it was my daughter was like you know we go from monta to quito super easy flight there's like the security is a breeze at the monta airport it was wonderful i wish the tsa would would you know learn from them and just disband but um <laughs> and then and then you know and then we go from quito to miami no big deal and we get to miami before our miami to charleston flight we've got to go through customs and all this stuff and immigration whatever and uh and I remember my son was like, and because we had done it on the way down, the first thing he said when we went from uh, Monta to Quito, he was like, wait, can, are they going to let us on the flight? I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, they, they, didn't, they didn't like do our passports. Don't they need our passports and all this stuff? And I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's just for when we're going to Miami. And he's like, well, why? Why not when we're going to Quito? And I'm like, well, because it's, it's just a different city, not a different country. And he's like, well, that seems dumb. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. You know, I'm just normalized to it. And then when we go back, he's like, wait, 
Why do we have to go through all this immigration stuff? Isn't, isn't Miami in the United States? Like we're already in the United States. So we're just going from Miami to Charleston. I'm like, yeah, but we just arrived from another country. So they, he's like, well, this just, this just seems so stupid. Like we live here. What, what, what's wrong? Why won't they, like, they're not going to let us back into like our own home. You know, he was just like, he thought it was all really weird. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting um, way to see how over time, that stuff just gets hammered in because you see all these, you know, everything's all official and, and you need papers and all this stuff. And so you start to treat it as a really big deal. Yeah. It's also like the crappy <coughs> reality of traveling, you know, like if you want to go somewhere that's outside of the country that you're from, you are forced to deal with that. Yeah. But it's yeah. also, it makes you think about, um, I was recently reading the book, uh, The Persuasion. Um, and one of the things to talk about in there is kind of this like sunk cost, I guess, I don't know if it would be a part of the sunk cost fallacy but with fraternities there's this big initiation ritual where you have to go through this like painful humiliating process but since there is this like cost you value the thing on the other side more um to think that you know travel becomes maybe like more exotic or more uh, yeah m more exotic maybe more interesting because you have to go through this like kind of annoying immigration process is kind of an interesting thought to think about. Yeah. You, you had to earn it. You're part of a, an elite club, you know, cause yeah. you had to go through, no, it's weird. It, it does have this weird and, and there are elements to that that can be like, Oh, this is cool. This is exclusive. But there are also elements where it can make you feel again. It's, you know, it's another variation of what I was jokingly calling the Steve jobs fallacy where, where it makes you hold international travel to a, to a standard that you wouldn't hold domestic travel to like, okay, we had to go through all this inconvenience. We better get a lot out of this. This better be a life changing experience. If it's only kind of cool, then it was a total waste. And it's like, well, why not? Like we, I took my family up to Pittsburgh for five days and it was only kind of cool. And we weren't like, wow, maybe we shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it's because the bar is so high, your standards are so high um, which is kind of too bad, you know, because it, it, it reduces the incentive to take risks and explore. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a super interesting point. Um, I'm curious what benefits do you think like your children had from being away from the United States for six weeks, if any? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely, I think it's definitely going to do something that, um, international travel did for me when I was young, which is just, it just gives you a really valuable perspective. I don't want to say in like a moralistic way, like, oh, you need to go live somewhere that's poor so you can appreciate what you have. I, I don't think it's like right or wrong, but I think it's valuable. Mm -hmm. I think it enhances your ability to put things in perspective and to navigate the world successfully, including your own emotions and feelings. It's like, oh yeah, I remember that time where, you know, uh, we had to get behind the mosquito nets in the bed every night at six o'clock. Um, and we actually had kind of a fun time. It wasn't that big of a deal. So, uh, you know, oh, well, uh, our power went out because it's raining and I can't play my computer for a few hours. So what? Like I've been through that. That happened in Ecuador all the time. You know, like I think it kind of helps you kind of put in perspective things that maybe you stress about or get worried about that, that are not that big of a deal in the scheme of things. It makes you really appreciate a lot of things. And it also makes you realize that you are a lot freer than you think. You tend to feel like, well, I couldn't leave my house for like six weeks because I don't like who will take care of it or, or, you know, well, I can't, I can't quit my job because I need the money to pay for all these things that I'm maintaining in my lifestyle. I have, I have a, you know, whatever, a boat and two cars, whatever. And you start to realize, you know, when we all travel, e each of us, we didn't, check any bags with our, with our family. Everybody had one carry on. And for six weeks, that was totally fine. And not that that's morally better. Like once we're back home, we're using a lot more stuff than we use there. But I think it's a great reminder that like, if I need to, if I want to, I can ditch a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I have, a, I'm a lot more sort of light, if you will, um, than I think I am. There's this great scene. I, it's supposed to be a, a negative scene. It's supposed to be sort of like showing how messed up this guy is, I think. But the, in the movie, um, what's the movie called? It's uh, something about In Flight or uh, it's it's got uh, George uh, Clooney. Up in the Air. Up in the Air. And he's talking about the backpack. Everything you in your whole life is in this backpack. Like that's how you want to live. And he's like this expert traveler with a million like, you know, miles on on all of his credit cards or whatever. And um, 
you know, and, and he doesn't want anything to tie him down, relationships or things or whatever. And it's kind of supposed to be revealing how he's this lonely man who has no long term connections and, and, you know, whatever. No comment on that. But, but there's something so powerful about that scene. I saw that and I'm like, yeah, that's how I want to be. Like, I want to be able to say, let's go somewhere. Let's, let's live in a new place for a while. Let, just put everything we need in a backpack. That's all we need. We don't need all this other stuff. We can get the other stuff. I love enjoying stuff. I like enjoying nice couches and nice cars and whatever, but I don't have to own it all and maintain it all. And I don't have to be tied down to it if I don't want to. So I think that's going to, going to be a really helpful. I mean, I've already seen a little bit with my kids, just like, you know, my son used to insist that he could only, you know, do certain things on his laptop. He couldn't do it on his Kindle fire because the screen was too small and it didn't have this, that, and the other thing. And the whole trip, like, I'd be like, don't you want to get out your laptop? No, I'm fine with the Kindle. Cause for a while, that's all he could use. And it just sort of like, just in small ways, you just realize, um, I'm a lot more flexible and nimble and able to adapt than I thought I was. Um, mm-hmm. and definitely my middle daughter, just seeing her gain so much confidence in interacting with all kinds of people. And it almost, it almost, she's kind of shy and quiet. She's very confident in terms of doing things, but she's not much of a talker with people. Um, she kind of just observes. And I think it almost relieved the burden of like, and she, she's like very serious. She doesn't like like cheesy small talk that people make to children Mm -hmm. being in a place where no one speaks English. It almost relieved that burden. And so for her, it was like, great, we can get right to the point. Like I want to go get something at the store. I just point at it and hand them the money and I don't need to, they don't need to be like, Oh, you're so cute. Look at your hair. Like she hates that kind of stuff. So it was kind of cool for her to, to see her just like really engage and feel like, Hey, I can, like, I think she's unaware. I think she is now more on this after this trip of how awesome she is. Like she's a really capable girl. I truly think I could drop her off anywhere within 50 miles of our house and she would know how to get back. Just like, she's one of those kids that has like this, this sort of like street smarts thing. And I think she didn't know how much she was different from her siblings in that way until we were in this different context. And that was kind of cool to see. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, So we want to not take up your entire evening. (laughs) Is there, um, has your mind drifted to the future and the idea of traveling with your family again? Yeah. uh, It's funny. My wife was like, let's, let's just not think about anything like that for a while. Cause, cause this was kind of like, well, let's do a test run and maybe, um, we could do something where we spend two months every year living in a, in a different place, uh, maybe the same place, maybe back to Ecuador or maybe a different country each time. And if, and if we can work it out so that it's like break even cost wise, you know, um, like we were supposed to do this time. So this was kind of like a test run in, in part and getting back. I think my wife was just like, so relieved that like we made it, we survived. She's like, let's just not think about that for a while. And I'm like, cool, that's fine. I'm really, even though I was able to get a lot of work done, um, I'm really busy with work right now and I'm, I'm doing some travel for work and I'm kind of not thinking, I actually haven't even reflected on this trip very much. So I was kind of like, I don't know if I'll be ready for this podcast. We got back four days ago and I really haven't processed it or thought about it much. Um, so I've kind of like purposefully not thinking about it, but I know in my gut, I know that like, it's like entrepreneurship. Like once you get a taste of it, you're just a terrible employee. You never want to work for anybody again. And it's like, once you've traveled the world, you're just a terrible citizen. Like you don't have to do it all the time. I don't, I don't think I'll ever be to the, to the, to the wanderlust level that, that you guys are world, world wanderers, um, where it's just like, Oh my gosh, we've been home for two weeks. We better go somewhere. But I think, I think once, I think once a year or something like that, I think we'll start to be like, you know, like, let's, let's see some stuff. Let's do some stuff, you know, and and there's still a lot more to do within the U S but I, I definitely think spending more than just a week vacation, more like a month or two in a different location once every year, every few years is definitely in the cards for us. That's awesome. Awesome. I love that. I think it's super cool that you that you guys took your kids down to Ecuador. I know it's something that Ryan and I have talked about is something that we would want for our potential future children. So it's cool to hear of somebody who did it successfully. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're I'm um, I'm uh going in, I was like, oh, I I I almost I blogged about it a few times, but I was like, I kind of feel like douchey, like, oh, as if this is so cool. Now coming back. Now I'm like, no, I'm really proud of us. <laughs> that, that was actually really cool. I'm really glad we did it. And it was, it was harder than I thought it would be both leading up and doing it. And I'm glad that we did it and we stuck with it. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're up for, uh, the adventure and you, you, you have, if any part of you hears this 
if every part of you is like, that sounds terrible, then don't do it. But if any part of you is like, man, that I don't think I could do that, but I kind of wish I was the type of person who could do it, then I would say you probably can do it. Yeah, I love that. I think too, like the biggest growth comes from getting outside of your comfort zone. So absolutely. Always push yourself there. That's why you guys are going to have some kids, right? <laughs> it's not the right time right okay, now. Okay, <laughs> we're going to cut off this interview. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> um, so where should people go to find out more about you, Isaac? Yeah, so um, my my company that I've mentioned a few times is Praxis, and our, our website's discoverpraxis.com. And if you're if you're 18 to 25, um, you might be interested in in Praxis, especially if you're in the U.S. But uh, sometimes we're we're able to accommodate, uh, you know, given given U.S. immigration issues can be difficult, but we can accommodate some some uh, Canadians like me, Canadians from time to time, like Ryan. So discoverpraxis.com is my company. I also blog there every once in a while, but I have a personal website as well, IsaacMorehouse.com. Um, you know, I write about education, family, entrepreneurship, a whole lot of stuff. And, uh, if you, if you want to know a little more about the Ecuador trip, if you go to IsaacMorehouse.com, just type in Ecuador on the little search thing. And there is uh, a podcast and maybe a two or three blog posts with a little more information as well. Amazing. And we'll definitely put links to all that stuff on the show notes and whatnot so that people can check it out. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, guys. I hope to someday come back with uh, more stories from more countries. Thank you yeah, so thank much. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. You bet. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. We enjoyed partaking in it as participants. Yeah, definitely. Isaac is super, super cool to talk to. And if he's ever in your area speaking, I definitely recommend checking him out for sure. He's incredibly awesome to watch speak as well. Yeah, he has a quite a few good lectures on YouTube that you can check out if you're interested. There's one in particular called People Over Politics, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Go check it out. Just Google just it. Search just, him on YouTube. Just You'll find search Isaac Morehouse. Um, yeah, and if you're curious about Praxis and want to find out more about my experience, you can definitely send me an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. As always, see you next week. And thanks for listening. Bye. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanderers or on Twitter at worldwanderers1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.